Well, there, John. This is uh, Glenn Lowry, BloggingHeads.tv, The Glenn Show, and I'm with John Wood, Jr. Uh, John is uh, the director of media development at an organization called Better Angels, and uh, we're here to talk about politics, polarization, and race in America today. Welcome, John. Thank you very much, Glenn. It's a pleasure to be on with you. John, I'm not sure everybody knows uh, what Better Angels does, but I think everybody does know that uh, we are living in a time of uh, political polarization in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to talk a little bit uh, both about how you see the current uh, climate politically and about uh, the nature of the organization that you're involved with and the work that you guys do? Yeah, well, I think that polarization in the United States has reached a point of I guess, relative critical mass. So I think that for a long time, about as long as I've been around, and you know, I, I started paying attention to politics as a young person in the 90s, and I remember the, uh, the Clinton impeachment uh, process and the Monica Lewinsky scandal and all that, and I remember people at that time saying that uh, politics, just, they could hardly remember when it had been that nasty. And yet it's only gone downhill from there, I think. I think that we're in a situation where the political parties have an interest, and in not just the parties, but the media establishments, they have an interest, I think, to cater to a constituency on the basis of that constituency's desire for ideological fair and partisan gamesmanship. And that institutional interest in both the media and the parties has nothing much to do with facilitating the sort of objective uh, distribution of reliable information or the accomplishment of political progress in government. And worse still, it fans the flames on the communal level and on the individual level to where I think that the way we are starting to look at one another, the way we've been looking at each other as fellow Americans, has now been colored more by, in many cases, more by the sort of funhouse mirror image that we have of each other as political creatures as opposed to the bonds that we should share, the common values that should be sort of more emphasized, that should exist between us as, as fellow Americans. So I think that it's, uh, there's a toxic quality to our politics today that tears at the social fabric even as much as it corrodes the gears of government. And in that context, what Better Angels does is uh, Better Angels is an organization that creates space for uh, liberals and conservatives, or blues and reds, as we say in our uh, in-house. Uh, we bring folks together, uh, one community at a time, and we've done this in 32 states across the nation, plus Washington, D.C., where we take small groups of people from each side of the aisle. We bring them into a, a, a common location where each side gets to not so much debate or argue politics, per se, but... Uh, we invite each side to speak from the vantage point of what you might refer to as their own lived experience, so to speak. Um, so that rather than argue, uh, each side can get a sense of who the human beings are beneath the political label. And so these are seven hour workshop sessions, typically, uh, we do have shorter versions, but usually these are seven hour sessions, takes a full morning and afternoon. And we put people through a series of guided uh, dialogues and exercises. And um, by the end of it, what usually winds up happening is people may or may not find that they agree on politics with folks on the other side more than they did when they started, but almost inevitably people see the pe see folks on the other side of the political divide as much more human than they realize, and they tend to emerge as friends and even sometimes collaborators on local uh, political issues or even beyond that. So it is an exercise in in uh, rehabilitation of our civic and social relationships using principles of uh, family therapy in a political context. So that's in a, in a, in a walloping nutshell. Okay. So let me see if I understand, uh, starting from the baseline premise that the country is very divided and it's unhealthy, <laughs> noticing that there are institutions that actually have a vested interest in that division uh, you're trying to operate at a grassroots level, bringing people face to face who start out thinking that they have nothing or little in common, that they're enemies of one another. Right. And to um, uh, facilitate conversation and interaction between those people from which you think that a more 
tolerant uh, attitude, a more cooperative spirit, uh, a, a less uh, unbridgeable divide uh, will emerge. And you somehow think that these uh, small group encounters will uh, sow the seeds for something healthier and uh, uh, more, uh, more tolerance and, and, and a, a kind of uh, uh, live and let live, a, a, a more uh, mm. viable, you know, s- uh, civic uh, culture will emerge. I mean, mm-hmm. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a little utopian to me. I mean, let's let's take a few of the issues. Mm-hmm. So I believe it was uh, 1971, if I'm not mistaken, that the Roe versus Wade uh, Supreme Court decision was handed down. It might have been 73. Maybe you know better than I do. But mm-hmm. you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about abortion. I'm talking about mm-hmm. a woman's right to choose versus the fetus's right to life. The baby's, quote unquote, the baby's right to life. Right. Now, uh, the last time I looked, the, uh, the participants in this conflict over public policy around uh, a woman's uh, uh, body and, and about uh, the, uh, the rights of the fetus involved essentially unbridgeable mm. uh, differences in value. Mm. On one hand, people are calling other people murderers, baby killers. Mm. On the other hand, People are saying that uh, a bunch of politicians are trying to control a woman's body and a woman is going to be a free agent who can decide about her own body in any kind of society worth living in. Mm. What is a kitchen table conversation, even if the donuts are good, mm. going to do to to bridge that gap? Mm. Uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, I just want to give a few of the issues. Um, so on the one side, people are saying uh, unaccountable state violence perpetrated by racist police officers who were hunting down unarmed black men. Mm-hmm. On the other side, people are saying a guy like Michael Brown is a thug. Have you looked at the murder rate in these communities lately? We deserve to be protected from them. The policeman's got a very difficult job. They deserve our support. That's exactly what Donald J. Trump is saying every time he gets a chance to say it. Mm-hmm. Again, the last time I looked, there wasn't a whole lot that I could see of, mm-hmm. uh, different splitting that was going to resolve the dispute between people who think that the police are an occupying army on the one hand, and those who think that the police are the only thing between them and a a threat to our uh, civilization on the other. Mm -hmm. Um, So what I'm doing, I could go on, you know, there are many other examples, but the bottom line would be um, the reason that there's polarization is because there's dispute about fundamental issues about how we're going to live together and govern ourselves and that dispute is going to get resolved one way or another. Somebody's going to win and somebody is going to lose. There's mm-hmm. going to be a law about, um, about reproductive rights, and it's going to have certain extent and certain limitations, and that's the thing that we're battling about. And if I get my person in Congress, I'm closer to winning that battle than you are if you get your person in Congress, mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. And, and uh, unless somehow we resolve the objective issue differences between people by committing to and enforcing the views of one side versus the other. I don't understand how we get out of the, how we get out of the partisan divide problem. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the, the important thing to remember about our work with better angels is that it is not, it's not even our objective to get people to agree on issues like abortion would be nice, right? It's not necessarily our objective as an organization to get people to agree on the right balance uh, that needs to, be restri- needs to be struck with respect to uh, policing or criminal justice reform or any of these sorts of things. Um, now, would we like to see agreement on these things? Sure. How do you get agreement or how do you maximize the potential for agreement and productive consensus to evolve in a civil or governing context. It has to have a lot to do with creating an environment in which people are able to communicate healthily and productively. And so with us, our focus is on cultivating that environment from which a productive and, um, and uh, qualitatively progressive civil discourse and, um, and, and series of political act- interactions can spring. When people come together, and they have these conversations on these tricky issues. And they talk about 
you know, where, well, let's just take abortion as, a, as an example, because that's probably as difficult a one as, as there is, right? Um, I talk to people, and I'm a person who has worked in party politics. I was the vice chairman of the Republican Party in Los Angeles County. I was a nominee for Congress. As you know, I ran against Maxine Waters uh, several, several years ago. Um, I certainly can tell stories and, and recount anecdotes of conservatives who look at liberals as being essentially, like you said, sort of, you know, heartless baby killers who have no sort of sensitivity for, you know, for the value of, of unborn human life. And I can think of liberals who look at conservatives as people who just want nothing more than to establish patriarchal dominance over a woman and her, and her body, right? Right. And so these are the starting emotional and psychological sort of prisms through which we look at each other. You bring two people from these camps into a conversation, and if you're able to pull the right levers and press the right buttons and, and get each person to sort of set the environment in a way to where each person can listen to the other for a certain period of time without judgment, so this person, say, on the liberal left can hear the story of this man who grew up in, let's just say hypothetically, he grew up in a conservative Christian home. Maybe he had a, a mother who got pregnant at a time of life that was very difficult for her, but she made the decision to keep the baby that wound up being his baby sister. And, and that was the family that he grew up in. And suddenly he has this moving story of how he came to his, how he came to his, his conviction. Now she sees something about this human being. He's not, he's not a chauvinist, or at least he's not merely a chauvinist. He is a person who has a relatable human experience. And on the other side of the coin, um, she might be able to tell a very similar story um, about a, a choice that perhaps her mother her mother made with the previous pregnancy, that if that had gone through, uh, maybe she herself wouldn't exist, but her mother waited to have a child to where she could actually afford it and was able to provide her family with a good life subsequently. Does this establish the basis immediately thereafter an experience like that uh, for uh, mutual agreement on, on abortion policy? No, it doesn't accomplish that. But what it does do is it sets a stage to where these two people can look at each other and say with some sincerity, we are opponents, but we are not necessarily enemies. And moving people from one distinction to the next, one you know, relational distinction to the next, is a very important thing because the, the pattern that we are in the grips of now, when, uh, the spiral that we're in the grips of now, is that because we see each other as enemies and not merely the loyal opposition. What it means is that we have no respect for any of the legislative or political victories that the other side wins at any given point, such as would deter us from seeking to actively undermine and sabotage um, through a variety of means any political progress that is made at one time by one party uh, via the machinations and manipulations of political uh, parties and players and pundits and so forth the next time around. So in other words, we, we will find ways to cheat each other and we will find ways uh, to use the system against each other in a manner that makes progress unsustainable, much less consensus possible, right? So you look at the Kavanaugh hearings, for instance. Yeah. Um, there are, there are, um, part, I, I think that, I'm just, I'm just going to speak for Republicans for a moment, put my Republican hat on. A lot of Republicans felt, and not just Republicans, but particularly Republicans, a lot of folks felt that, you know, regardless of how weak um, uh, the case was, the objective case was against Kavanaugh as, as a person who was guilty of this heinous uh, action years back in his past at a point in time that nobody could subsequently scrutinize, Republicans felt that Democrats, regardless of what the facts were, that Cory Booker and, and, and Dianne Feinstein and so on and so forth, that they had already made up their mind, and many of them had, to oppose whoever Trump rolled out as, as judicial nominee. Therefore, anything that they do has to be looked at as insincere, right? But on the other hand, you might imagine that Democrats felt assuming that they were acting, some Democrats at least may have been acting cynically in this. And again, I'm not saying that that Kavanaugh or Blasey Ford was innocent or guilty. I'm not rendering a judgment on that. I'm talking about perceptions and polarization here. But you might imagine that many Democrats thought that, well, um, if we have to play a rough game 
to obstruct Trump's nominee and the conservative agenda. It makes sense for us to do so because the Republicans obstructed Merrick Garland in a way that was totally unfair prior to this. Yeah. But let's race to the bottom in terms of our ability to sabotage the other side's agenda. That race to the bottom is only possible in a civic and social context where we have come to the conclusion that there is no sort of humanity worth respecting in the opposition. And because we can't necessarily rely on our leaders and government and media uh, to pump the brakes on that sort of attitude, it's important to facilitate that kind of a renaissance okay, and civic discourse on the cultural level. Yeah. No, I, I got the spiel, man, but I'm not convinced. Mm. Um, you're a Republican. Yeah. Where, where, where do you stand on Donald J. Trump? Is he a good president? Is, uh, he, is he your president? I think that I think that well, he's definitely my president because he's the president of the United States of America, and this is my did, country. Did you vote for him? May I ask you that? I, if that's a rude question, you don't have to answer. No, 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 I, no. I, I didn't vote for him. I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton either. I voted for uh, voted for Gary Johnson. It was more of a protest vote, but uh -huh. but I did vote for I did. So vote you're for one him. of those Republicans. <laughs> well, you can call you me one of those Republicans. No, here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. There was an election. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton were the principal candidates for president. Mm -hmm. The direction of the country was going to be very different mm -hmm. based on which one of them won. Mm -hmm. sure. These third party guys never had any chance of winning. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, I don't blame. I'm, I'm not judging your vote. I'm not judging your vote at oh, all. That's what, what, and, I, and I get it. I, I get mm -hmm. not voting for Donald Trump. I believe me. I, you know, I can mm -hmm. relate to that. Yeah. But what I'm saying is. Uh, the stakes are tremendously high and there's a battle. There's a fight that's going on. We're talking, you're talking, it sounds to me like, uh, let's be nice. Mm. Uh, let, let's be civic minded. Uh, let's be good players. Let, let's, let's, mm -hmm. let's be decent people. I mean, it's almost a well, and, 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 and let's, and let's, argument. let's organize around these. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. I, I okay. beg your pardon. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Pardon me for interrupting. I was just saying in addition to, you know, play nice and so forth. Let's organize around these civic virtues so that we can build up a culture and a structure mm -hmm. interaction that can begin to revitalize the civic culture from the ground up and in any other way uh, we can so that we can stabilize, stabilize this, this political situation over time. Uh, I'm sorry, Glenn, did you want to round out that point? Because I think I got an answer for you. Yeah, no, what, I was, what I'm trying to say is uh, there's a thing called process. Mm -hmm. You know, where we use the right words, we smile at each other, uh, we don't stab in the back, uh, we, we more or less try to preserve the institutional integrity of the environment that we're operating in. Mm -hmm. We're high minded. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a thing called uh, winning mm -hmm. and controlling the agenda, making the law, setting the policy mm -hmm. uh, and, and directing the government. Mm. And and uh, I'm trying to figure out how those things relate to each other. I'm, I'm imagining that some of the partisanship and the and the nastiness comes about because the stakes are very high and because mm. the questions are of a zero sum nature. It's yeah. not going to be 50 50. It's mm. going to be either a woman has a right to control her body or she doesn't. Mm. It's going to be either that, uh, you know, we uh, uh, change the law so that we don't have so many uh, young black men uh, being assaulted by police, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, winning may not be pretty, uh, it may not be nice, uh, but it ought to be satisfying uh, mm -hmm. if you're serious about what's actually at stake. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's why I mentioned Trump, because, uh, as you know, uh, yeah. there are a substantial number of our fellow citizens who are determined to um, basically reverse the results of an election in 2016, remove this man from office, and stymie the aspirations of the people who supported him. Mm -hmm. I think that the future of the republic is at stake. Right. Uh, sitting, sitting around a kitchen table and smiling at somebody and learning that they're not, you know, Darth Vader, they're not the devil incarnate, doesn't <laughs> change the fact that doesn't change the fact that um, uh, he's either going to be in the uh, Oval Office or he's not. And uh, the policies that he wants to pursue vis-a-vis -vis trade, taxes, uh, immigration. Uh, social policy of one kind or another uh, are either going to be what they are or, or they're going to be something different. Mm. Uh, and, and that's, and that's what's at stake. And I, I, I I'm sorry to go on so long. I, what I'm just trying to say is there's something that feels a little bit utopian, a little bit kind of dreamlike mm. uh, in my mind about this idea that I'm going to cultivate a set of attitudes among people that's going to tamp down partisanship 
when the structural foundations for partisan difference are as stark and as deeply etched as they are? Well, except that our civic structure, I think, is, first of all, it, it's, it's important to, for, for me to concede that the reason we have politics to begin with uh, is as a substitute for violence, ultimately, right? I mean, a state exists to monopolize violence, to monopolize force, because in the absence of reasonable conversation and constructive processes for making conversations and taking the temperature of, of larger consensus and so forth, our other option uh, is to fight with each other, you know, to potentially kill each other, so on and so forth. And um, that means that politics by nature, by definition, is going to involve a lot of chaos. It's going to involve uh, a lot of friction, right? So I've got, a pretty, I've got a pretty healthy tolerance for that. I'm a somewhat competitive person myself, right? But you said that it doesn't make a difference if a person thinks that, discovers that his political opponent happens not to be Darth Vader if it turns out that they still can't reach an agreement on a sensitive political issue. And I would respectfully disagree with that a little bit. I think it does make a difference if you go into a meeting thinking somebody is Darth Vader and you come out of it thinking that they might not be because it informs and clarifies how you go about treating that person going forward and how you go about negotiating with that person going forward and your willingness to tolerate an outcome in a political conversation or negotiation that doesn't necessarily jive with your interests, but that then leaves you with a decision, okay, am I going to try and cheat and sabotage the outcome of this uh, situation because the person uh, who's winning on the other side of this is Darth Vader, is my mortal enemy? Or am I, to the extent that I can tolerate possibly doing so, going to try and be constructive in helping a policy that I initially disagreed with maybe work out a little better, or even if I continue to oppose it, to do so in a good faith way that keeps me from, say, let's say, for example, uh, suggesting that the president who's in office is illegitimate for this reason or that reason so that I can undermine the very, uh, uh, well, the very legitimacy or credibility of anything that he happens to accomplish. And, and you know, uh, Democrats are doing that to Trump in many respects. Trump, I think, uh, and some Republicans did that to Obama back when he was in office. So here's, here's, here's the large point. And, and actually, let me address the Trump thing uh, head on. Yeah. Because I, I didn't vote for Donald Trump um, even though I can point to certain policies of his that I agree with, that I think are reasonably good. I, what I've been saying about Trump is, and if you want a couple examples, I, I think that the tax cut has, on the whole, I think it's been helpful. Um, certainly been helpful for growth. Um, I think moving, and this is controversial, but I think moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, presidents and politicians from both parties were promising to do that forever and ever and ever. Uh, and, but he actually did it. He actually kept his word on that. First president to ever keep his word on that. And I think that there was a reason to do so. Don't think it's going to be a barrier to peace um, if peace is on the table. I can think of things that Trump has done that I agree with. Um, I think that Trump is a disaster in many respects for American politics. But I don't think he's a policy disaster, although I can think of policies I don't like. That goes for all presidents. I think he's more of a cultural disaster. And, and I, what I mean by that is that yeah. I think that he has so not only solidified but accelerated a, de a deterioration in our civic culture and our civic discourse, which guarantees that no political and economic progress is going to be sustainable in the long run in this country, precisely because of the fact that our system has gone from a point to where Republicans and Democrats, for all their prior disagreements and prior ages, used to more or less agree that, hey, we're the loyal opposition and we're going to try and sort of make things work while seeking to, you know, maybe stab each other in the back now and then in the ways that we do. But the opposition between the parties, and I think that there's a lot of polling to indicate that this is ref was reflected in the views of average Americans as well. But for that generation, particularly that generation of of congressmen and senators who came out of World War II, who fought alongside each other, who had a great well of common memory and so forth. These are people for whom Kennedy and Nixon, I don't think that they looked at each other as representing existential threats to their own nation. But Clinton and Trump, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, essentially did, right? And so however much you might approve of Donald Trump's policies, if 
if I am right in saying that the type of influence that Trump is representing, I'm not trying to put this all on Trump. He's more indicative of, of the larger, of the larger issue here. But however much you like, you might support Trump's policies. If it's true that the social fabric is rending in this extreme way, then that means that Trump's tax cuts will not do much good for us in the long run because the Democrats will come along when they take power back, which they probably will eventually, uh, and totally obliterate anything Trump has done. And the rule of law will erode in quite the same fashion. The credibility of our institutions declining, nobody trusting the FBI, people not trusting the media to be dispassionate and objective. What happens when, in, when trust in institutions deteriorate to an ultimate level? It means that the edifice of society, structurally speaking, starts to crumble. And I see the foundation of keeping these things up and intact as resting firmly in the civil, social, cultural layer where we've got to rehabilitate people's point of view. Do you think that uh, President Obama between 2009 and 2016 um, was a more uh, um, was a president who facilitated uh, more effectively a kind of uh, culture, a political culture that was uh, more tolerant of the other side? Mm. Uh, that's that's a question. With the Affordable Care Act being forced through on a party line vote, mm -hmm. uh, with what many people regard to have been the weaponization of certain offices in the federal government, whether it be in the Department of Justice or the FBI or the uh, Internal Revenue Service or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, with um, the president saying about a pretty good man, uh, mm -hmm. John McCain, in retrospect, now everybody recognizes what kind of man he was, but in 2008, as I recall, uh, if he wasn't Darth Vader, he was a good substitute for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and about uh, Mitt Romney in 2012, again, now that he's going to be a U.S. senator from Utah, people are hoping that he'll be the anti-Trump voice within the Republican Party. But at the time of that election, as I recall, uh, he was a uh, rapacious, capitalist, greedy, uh, heartless, racist, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Uh, anyway, not to go on too long about this, was Obama better than Trump with respect to uniting the country? Um, mm -hmm. Was it the racist fault? Is it, and I'll stop, that uh, the white supremacists out there, both those who are out of the closet and those who won't even acknowledge their own racism, mm -hmm. are chafing at their uh, approaching demographic marginality, mm -hmm. uh, are resentful of the fact that a black family was in the uh, Oval Office for in the White House for eight years, um, want to take their country back, and this is who uh, Trump is appealing to, uh, and uh, whatever the faults of Obama might have been, they were largely a consequence of the fact that the country, too many people within the country, you lie, shouted out while he's making a national address on television, um, uh, wouldn't accept the fact that a black man had ascended to that position. And what I want to know is how meetings around the kitchen table between folk of goodwill are going to resolve uh, uh, differences of that kind. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So the question is uh, is about Obama. Do I think? Yeah, the Obama question is, is about Obama, right? right. But, but of course, my point is Trump, Maybe. Obama, whatever. The country is the country. The mm -hmm. under and and politics is a very tough game. Mm -hmm. People want to win. That's the that's the first order yeah. issue. Well, let, well, let me speak to Obama really quick. Yeah, please do. Um, uh, so I was a Democrat in two thousand eight. I grew up uh, a Democrat, really, uh, uh -huh. and I was an activist in. Uh, in high school, passing out bumper stickers for Al Gore's campaign in 2000, speaking at um, city council meetings, opposing the, um, the, the, the run-up to the Iraq War, I see. second Iraq War. And um, I became jaded about politics at a very early age uh, when George W. Bush won re-election in 2004. Uh, I thought at that point, ah, it doesn't work. Everything I did didn't matter don't really want to deal with this anymore. Let me find something else to do. And the thing that got me interested in politics again was the emergence of an individual who I thought, who I related to a whole lot in many respects, and that was Barack Obama. Now, I was a person who thought myself a liberal, but I thought myself a liberal in the tradition of Martin Luther King Jr. And I felt that, I felt that uh, even then, I felt that what America needed, what America always needs, what the world always needs, um, but certainly in the midst of the division of the Bush years, was a re 
was the articulation of a philosophy akin to the nonviolent philosophy which sought to highlight the humanity and the worth and the dignity of people across the political and racial spectrum in an effort to create a cultural context where people could come together and, and, and uh, collaborate more effectively. So I was singing the same song uh, when I was 15 years old as I am now at the age of 32. And so I worked for Obama's campaign because I thought that his message of hope and change resonated with the nonviolent values of Dr. King, the idea that love is a transformational social force. That's my, that's my root conviction. Lynn. And, uh, but during that course of time, and we probably don't have time for the long version of the story, but I was a Republican, or at least an independent, by about, uh, by about midway through 2010 or so. The way I saw it was Barack Obama had made two major commitments as a candidate uh, for, for president. And I found his campaign to be inspire his campaign to be inspiring in a life changing way for me. But I thought the two things that he that he had committed to America to do was number two, uh, fix the economy uh, because we were in free fall and all that, uh, and number one, uh, create a healing in this country that could head off the budding or the the even then metastasizing political and racial vitriol. And I thought that he, I thought that he came up short on both of those counts. Now, at the same time, a lot of things had happened. I was experiencing something of a religious conversion. My wife joined the army, and I moved to Colorado, which, compared to LA, was very conservative. Lived in a military town, got married, uh, and started. Well, actually, the irony is the chief irony here is as a means of pushing this hope and change revolution forward, I took it upon myself to really try and study conservatives and conservatism and in a way that I never had before. And I read books like The Wealth of Nations and Atlas Shrugged and the Bible and all of these other things as a means of understanding more about who Republicans are and what conservatism was about. And in the context of observing what I thought to be the sort of failure to take seriously his own uh, commitment as a presidential candidate to healing the nation and also beginning to see some sense in free market economics and in the importance of a lot of traditional uh, uh, cultural values and so forth, I found myself, uh, you know, uh, putting on a new hat, so to speak, politically. Can so you, no, can, I, 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 excuse I, me I, for interrupting, yeah. but I'm going to ask you to expand a little bit. You said failure to uh, deliver on the promise of hope and change. Can you say more specifically how it is you feel that the president, that is Obama, failed yeah. during his uh, time in office to deliver on that promise? Well, I, I, I felt that he failed to. Uh, I felt that he failed to approach uh, to approach that issue with any sort of uh, strategic or systematic uh, intentionality. So, with everything else, a political candidate, you know, uh, political candidates frequently run claiming that they're going to unite people. And you know that it's usually rhetoric. I mean, maybe the sentiment is there, maybe it's not, depending on who you're talking about, but it's usually, it's usually rhetoric. But they do have plans in place for, you know, for fixing the economy or, or regulating, you know, this industry or that, whatever the case may be. Politicians usually do have some sort of strategy for, for advancing a political agenda. So that's where the constructive thought goes in. My hope for Obama was that he would actually have a, a strategy uh, for what I would now call depolarization. And there were flickers of it here and there of, of imagination. I, I remember at the beginning of 2010, uh, he accepted an invitation from Boehner and Cantor to that Republican retreat. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah, I remember. It was a small but, but a beautiful uh, little moment uh, in an otherwise tumultuous, you know, back and forth between the two sides, where the Republican legislators were there, some were there with their wives. I think one even had his uh, had a kid or two on his knee, and they welcomed the president of the opposing party into their into their midst uh, in a spirit of you know a little bit of tension, but also a good deal of congeniality. And Obama conducted himself uh, uh, in precisely the way I would have I would have wanted him to. But I don't see why a thing like that couldn't have been done once a quarter. I don't see why he couldn't have gathered the leaders of Congress to have the sorts of sit-down conversations that at the last minute they started to have over the Affordable Care Act for the American people to see them 
see them interacting uh, periodically throughout the course of, of each year, every year of his presidency. And so these are ceremonial things at the very least that I thought he might show some creativity in instituting uh, or, or something along those lines. I also thought that in his rhetoric, as he did on the campaign trail as president, he might also be forthright and intentional in, while pointing out his areas of disagreement with his opponents, also highlighting the understandable sorts of genesis of, uh, genesis of conservative perspectives to make it clear that he could empathize with his opponents while still seeking to defeat them politically. So the reason these things are important is because it sets the tone for the culture and it sets the tone for the rest of the nation, for the parties, for the media, and for how it is we interact with each other in our own, in our own lives. This is why the President of the United States is not just a head of government, Glenn, he is a head of state. Yeah. I voted against Trump really on the basis of the fact that he was going to be the head of state, even more so than the idea that he'd be the head of government. Like I said, yeah. it's the head of government. He's got some policies across the finish line that I can, you know, I, I can nod my head at. Uh, but that head of state position is an important thing as well. And I think that we underestimate the importance of these cultural symbols and ceremonies and interactions at our peril because really it's sort of the, the invisible edifice of everything else. Okay, now I'm, I'm, still, I'm still playing the devil's advocate with you a little bit and uh, pushing back against the Better mm-hmm. Angels program. Yeah. Where are you on identity politics? I'm talking about racial identity mm-hmm. politics. Where are you on nationalism? I'm not talking about necessarily white nationalism, but I am talking about uh, uh, putting America first. Mm -hmm. Uh, Is a president who wants to put America first good or bad for the, you know, the fabric of uh, civic life in the country? And is a president who seeks to get elected by marshalling uh, the block voting of of, uh, identity groups uh, by race, gender, sexual preference and orientation and whatnot, Good or bad for the civic health of, if from your point of view, uh, of the you know the partisan uh, climate that mm-hmm. we're operating in politically. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I I think that that's I think it's an important question, but it's not the critical question. But but I'll, I'll answer that question as. A and then tell us why you don't think it's the critical question. Okay. Right. Absolutely. So I don't think that <laughs> there's a version of nationalism which is not problematic, and or or at least is not necessarily exceptionally problematic to the health of civic society. And I think that there's an identity politics that is not necessarily particularly problematic to the health of civil society. Um, And I think that a nationalism that seeks to put America first, put American interests first, which, by the way, is, in my opinion, what a president ought to be doing. I mean, anybody representing the interests of the United States of America in some, you know, neutral sense, ought almost by definition be a national. I mean, he ought, he ought, he need be a patriot at the very least, right? And what are, what's the qualitative difference between these things? I understand there's distinctions. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that this is in many respects a moment on the nationalism side wherein the, uh, the particular sort of, not just uh, material interests, but even sort of, identity of the United States of America in the context of an increasingly interconnected global society is such that it makes sense to me that somebody should speak for the fact that at the end of the day, the USA is going to be the USA. And we, and while the United States of America exists uh, with the belief that is important for us to help uplift the world in all of these different ways, whether through foreign aid or through advocating for freedoms of oppressed peoples, possibly in military intervention. I mean, these are all tricky things. I'm not advocating one thing or another, but just to say that while it is we should be committed to the welfare of the world, we ought to recognize the fact that we can't do much for the world unless we, unless we see to our own, first and foremost, right? Um, and so in that sense, I can find uh, points of resonance with aspects. Uh, I emphasize the word aspects, but with aspects of, of Trump's or really just what people in general are getting at in terms of their affinity for nationalism. And then on the identity politics side, I do believe that the beauty of the United States of America is in large part the fact that we are a melting pot. And I recognize that there is what some people would call a sort of a regressive left tendency uh, ironic because in, ostensibly these are the forces that are heir to Dr. King's and others, the legacy of the civil rights movement and so forth, which 
in King's case, the mainstream of which was integrationist and so forth. Um, but I can understand the feelings of people, black, not just black, Latino, uh, Asian, uh, even, even white, uh, who say we don't want to lose the identity, first of all, that they don't want to lose the identity of their particular cultural group in the swirling of this melting pot. And secondarily, that their own particular group has a range of interests that are peculiar and particular to them that therefore, in a political context, need to be spoken to with the sensitivity to that specific cultural context. And you can't rally people in that cultural context past a certain degree unless you're able to speak authentically and empathetically to it and with it. And therefore, the, there's, there's, a, there's a degree to which politics just as a thing is kind of, is kind of always going to be identity-based in some sense. Uh, and I think that that's fine. I think that the difficulty, so, so I think the reason I said I don't think that it's the critical question is because the critical question for me is, can you, we should always advocate for our own interests. But then we should recognize the fact that our own interests are ultimately tied uh, to the interests of the broader body, to the interests of a nation, and that our own, on an ethical level, our moral conception of ourselves as having value has got to transcend the fact that, you know, that, that we're black or that, or that I'm black or that I'm white or that I'm straight or that I'm gay. But it's got to elevate at a certain point to say that, okay, this level of identity is important, but beyond a certain point, it's not as important as my identity as an American. And my identity as an American maybe okay. is not as important as my identity as a human being, child of God, etc. So where national identity politics cut off the latter, that's where they become problematic. Yeah, see, I would have thought that a Better Angels program would, would have to be pro-nationalistic at some level in the sense that we're all in this thing together. And by that, I mean all Americans. Mm -hmm. So we we kind of have a, a common identity as American citizens and a common yeah. interest in in preserving the uh, the the quality of our of our lives together. Mm -hmm. and I would have thought it would be suspicious of identity politics if, in that, uh, it meant a kind of uh, a balkanization, mm -hmm. a dividing of the electorate into these uh, uh, separate. Uh, 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 groups that uh, understand themselves primarily in terms of a relatively narrow dimension mm -hmm. of our total humanity. I would have thought that a Better Angels program uh, would have to emphasize the fact that every human being is many, many, many things. They may have a certain sexuality, they may have a certain ethnicity uh, and whatnot, but they, they mm -hmm. may have a certain religiosity, but we are many things. And that to put too many, too much emphasis on one dimension uh, of our of our personality of our personhood uh, is uh, is really bad for civic health. I mean, it means uh, we can't get the kind of compromise that we need to get in order to be able to live together. Sure, uh, something like that. I would have thought Better Angels would say to Colin Kaepernick when he takes a knee, uh, and his colleagues would say, "Look, yeah, we understand there is an issue about police violence, and we definitely want to deal with it, but don't make the ceremonial uh, honoring of the country." the place where you uh, decide to express your uh, disagreement with a particular aspect of policy because it's the country that's going to have to address whatever the policy questions are that you are, uh, uh, that you are concerned about. So this, this uh, uh, marginal, you know, raised fist, you know, kind of militant uh, rejection of, of, the, of the common uh, love of country expression is the wrong place and the wrong time uh, to try to make that argument. Let's get all on the same page as Americans, and then we can figure out how we want to live together as Americans, something like that. Mm. Um, so, so again, I mean, I'm kind of like back to my, uh, to my uh, square one here, which is there are underlying substantive issues. Mm -hmm. You have a debate, a debate about affirmative action. People are being counting. How many blacks are in this or that position doing this or that job? Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, maybe we shouldn't be looking at people primarily in terms of what race or whatever that they belong to. And we would have a very different view about affirmative action. Maybe it would be more class based and race based if we didn't look at each other so much as belonging to these different uh, racial groups. You got a guy like Mark Lilla. I know you know his book, mm -hmm. uh, Once in Future Liberal, where he's arguing identity politics is Reaganism for lefties. It's another excuse mm -hmm 
for us not to uh, see each other all in the same boat and be willing to extend the hand across the aisle to help the other guy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, I mean, I want you guys <laughs> to take a stand, well, not just to be so process oriented, but to be against some of the actual stuff that is going on that is keeping us. Well, uh, this but see, but see, well, here's, here's the beautiful thing about better <laughs> angels. Then. The yeah. beautiful thing about better angels is that, is that you yourself, Glenn, and we welcome you with open arms, my friend, if you wish to jump in this boat and row a little bit. Well, you know, uh, uh, David Blankenhorn, who is, uh, is running the show, isn't he? Uh, my boss. An old, old friend of mine. I mean, we've been mm -hmm. around the block once or twice, you know. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, willing right. to you. Well, there you go. But I was going to say that the beautiful thing about Better Angels is that you can, you can be on board with Better Angels and not have to moderate your political positions whatsoever. What we ask you to do is to take a look at the humanity of the person on the other side and engage in an ongoing sort of ongoing sort of uh, dialectic and a process of getting to know the other person that can allow for us to disagree in a more constructive manner. So I've already said all that stuff already. But yeah. let, let me ask you, Glenn, really quick. Can I ask you a question? Of course you can. Do you believe that there is a that there is a threshold for social division that if crossed represents an existential threat to the stability of any society's institutions or alternatively do you think that there's essentially no threshold for social division that is you know fundamentally problematic so long as so long as the right political faction within a society is ultimately able to sort of achieve its agenda in a certain election. Because okay, think, the vast implications to those two scenarios. No, I think I see why you asked me, and I, I would go with the first. Mm -hmm. There is a threshold which, when you cross, takes us into territory that we don't want to get into, and it threatens yeah. the very foundation of what we're trying to do together. Right. And you alluded to it earlier when you talked about violence, mm -hmm. and you said the willingness to accept a defeat in an election without demonizing the person who won or declaring as presumptively illegitimate what they want to do mm -hmm. is a uh, absolute necessity because the alternative to accepting defeat in elections uh, is violence. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, at the end yeah. of the day, if, yeah. I think, if I think that uh, Donald J. Trump is somebody who's a, a proto-fascist, Mm -hmm. Who's getting ready to turn America into the Nazi Germany of the 21st century? Or that worse uh, still, his 50 million followers are. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Then then maybe, uh, you know, extreme action is uh, justified in the face of uh, this kind of a threat to the republic. Um, if, if I feel like if I lose the election, I've lost everything. There's no coming back from that. Right. Well, you know, democracy is not going to be able to uh, convey legitimacy very long in an environment like that. So, so I absolutely mm -hmm. do think that there are lines. And if you ask me further whether I think we're in danger of crossing some of those lines right now, I would say yes. Mm -hmm. And if you ask me further where I thought it was coming mainly from the right or from the left, I'd say both. <laughs> I'd say both. I'd say the white yeah. supremacist in Charlottesville is a problem. Mm -hmm. I'd say the uh, Antifa uh, uh, hood clad mm -hmm. uh, guys running around on co college campuses and whatnot are a problem. Mm -hmm. I think right. they're the same problem. I think those cops that got shot down in Dallas by a Black Lives Matter inspired terrorist mm -hmm. right. uh, were victims of something that ought not to happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. And I think that when Dylan Roof went into that church in mm -hmm. uh, Charleston, South Carolina and shot up those people trying mm -hmm. to start a race war. This is the, uh, an indication of the kind of thing that we don't want to get anywhere near in this country if, if we want to preserve our, uh, our way of life. So, you know, yeah, I agree that there's a serious, yes. serious threat out there to the integrity of our institutions based upon political extremism coming from both sides. So do you mind if I tie that observation into my thoughts about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and the nonviolent philosophy and, and the legacy uh, thereof? Uh, because... I think that the thing that keeps, I think that the invisible sort of cog or component that keeps human civilization um, st uh, stable and, and enduring and ongoing and improving to the extent that it does these things is the fact that within the chaos of a relatively well-ordered society, you have a core of humanity, you have a core of the population that I think 
conducts itself, is willing to conduct itself according, uh, according to the fixed virtues that add up to yielding a moral character, according to things like honesty and humility and decency and all of these hallmark card values that most people don't think about. Which I got to actually... call you back, baby. I'm on a call. <laughs> Excuse me, John. Uh, that was my I wife. I needed to let her know that I, I, I heard her, <laughs> but I'll get back to her later. Go ahead. You were saying. I've been married for almost 10 years, man. I understand. Okay. You can um, <laughs> right. And uh, you don't notice those people a lot of times because they're humble, working people, middle-class people, whoever. The reason I make this point is because Martin Luther King Jr., and I, I wrote an article uh, for uh, uh, Reflections, which is a journal for the Yale School of Divinity, uh, about this a little bit. Uh, by, the, by this title, King, King, I believe, led a, what could be called a, a revolution in reconciliation in some, in some sense. This is Martin Luther King Jr. you're speaking of? Right. And what I mean by that is that in advancing a political movement that was based upon a philosophy that called upon its own adherents to take first and foremost responsibility for their own spiritual and internal psychological ethical conduct, their own internal attitudes towards their political opponents, uh, King sort of King sort of refilled the well, I think, of of civic virtue in the heart of our society because he called upon his own followers not to hate the people that they were opposing. And in so doing, they wielded a constructive moral leverage that, while it obviously didn't solve all problems, uh, was able to give a lot of people who were strident in their opposition to King and, and the civil rights movement uh, sort of psychological permission to let down their defenses after a protracted period of time and begin to look at things a different way and to look at, you know, in many cases, particularly African-Americans in a different way. Most political movements don't do that. Most political movements say all the guilt is on the other side, all the need for self-reflection, all the need for the cultivation of, uh, of and the maintenance of character uh, lies with the other side. We're good already. We're good as we are. We're not the problem, right? But then again, most political movements are destabilizing to one degree or another, even if they seek to address real problems, right? And so, you know, that's just part of the back and forth of politics and so forth. But, you know, well-meaning political movements do destroy political societies sometimes because they wind up becoming overcome by the... Tr by well, there's a tension between the state of strategic political motive for reform on the one hand and the emotional desire to get back at the opponent on the other. And when that undercurrent of, of anger or vitriol overrides whatever the legitimate policy sort of objective might be uh, on a reform level, you wind up getting things like, I don't know, like, like Marxism, like the communist revolution. Well, or, let, let me, excuse me for interrupting, but our, our time is going to be limited here. Yeah. And I want to get you to respond to something because you're talking about Martin Luther King Jr. Now, I have a certain impression. Mm -hmm. On the surface, Martin Luther King Jr. is the figure emerging out of the civil rights struggle from, let's say, the end of World War II to mm -hmm. 1970 right. that absolutely transformed the uh, legal status of blacks in the country. Mm -hmm. On the surface, he's the figure. Right. There's the King Memorial. There's the King Holiday. There's the King uh, Legacy, the King Narrative. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if down underneath for African-Americans, Malcolm X isn't actually really a more powerful mm. figure in the minds of the activists who are mm. setting the agenda today. Mm. I wonder if the uh, celebrity of Martin Luther King Jr. isn't the surface manifestation of a kind of uh, uh, political culture amongst African-American activists in which uh, the, the real uh, uh, influence out of the 1960s is uh, by any means necessary, uh, is, is uh, you've been hoodwinked, you've been bamboozled, is uh, white man ain't never going to let you have none unless you take it yourself, uh, mm. et cetera. Right. Uh, mm. When I look at uh, Black Lives Matter, and I'm not just singling them out, I think they're a very important indicator of where we are right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see a whole lot of Martin Luther King in that. I don't see a whole lot of Christian, I mean, this thing that you just got through saying, most political movements see all the problems on the other side and think themselves presumptively virtuous. Mm -hmm. uh, the nonviolent movement of Martin Luther King asks of those in the movement to look within themselves and to purge themselves mm -hmm. of certain instincts and orientations in order to 
uh, be willing to accept the blow coming from the oppressor without striking back. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, that's rooted in a in a particular mm -hmm. religious uh, moral uh, constellation, which I don't see having very much influence at all in the present day. Right? So isn't there something anachronistic or maybe even romantic about invoking mm -hmm. Martin Luther King? I mean, what are you going to say to the uh, LGBT uh, women? Uh, uh, gay women who are queer women, that's what they would call themselves, the queer mm -hmm. women who have been uh, very prominent leaders in the Black Lives Matter and whatnot, or to some of my students here on Brown University's campus who are uh, fired up and ready to go, as Obama would say, they're mm -hmm. fired up and ready to go, not because they're in, in the uh, thrall of some Martin Luther King uh, Christian piety, Mm -hmm. They're fired up and ready to go because by any means necessary, they're going to confront the system and, and uh, root out its injustice. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine we probably don't have time left for me to say all the things I have to say. On this this does not have to be our last conversation. Oh, I'm glad of that. I'm glad of that. But let me let me say the most important thing to be said here. Um, and because uh, when you talk about black lives, let me just take black lives matter. And when you talk about it and there are exceptions, I, you know, I've gotten to know, uh, not well, but I've gotten to know Hawk Newsom a little bit, who, if you don't know, is the Black Lives Matter leader in New York who went and visited that Trump rally and got up on stage and, you know, made his case to a lot of screaming people who didn't like him at first. But then he said, but I'm coming from a place of love and, and we all got to share and live in this country together. So I'm willing to work with you. And it was a beautiful moment, right? Yeah. And that guy says, he, in talking to him, he's about as far left as, as, as you go, you know? Okay, uh, but he still had that ethos, and it caused a lot of Trump people to look at him and Black Lives Matter even and say, "Okay, let's listen a little bit more closely than maybe we have." But in general, yeah, Malcolm X, and this was the case when I was in when I was in middle school. I, I you know, I, I can remember uh, you know kids twelve years old just starting to learn about about Black history and saying uh, saying uh, yeah, oh well, you know, love Martin Luther King Jr. admire him, but if I'd have been around back then, I'd have been with Malcolm, right? right. And um, the thing is, is people don't have a sophisticated understanding of Malcolm X either, first of all. But, um, he, but he is, uh, in our imagination, he's the archetypal mil militant. I guess he was to some extent. Right. And um, that is an easier thing for folks to grab onto because we've come to a cultural context in which we no longer understand the substance of love as a social power or an intellectual quantity. We just think of it as what Dr. King adamantly said that in his context, it was not, it was not. And that is quote, uh, mere emotional bosh, right? King was very, uh, very uh, deliberate in saying that love, uh, agape love, the, the, the love he was talking about was not affection, that rather it was a, it was a, a spirit of goodwill that sought to call forth what was good in the opposition as well as the self. Um, and um, the thing about that is that the substance of that philosophy is threatening to not just those antithetical elements within Black Lives Matter or the broader sort of left-wing activist culture, but but it's but it's threatening to those elements in precisely the same way I would argue that the teachings of Jesus uh, in the Gospels and the Beatitudes, um, that the that the peaceful teachings of Jesus are themselves a, in a sense a threat to a lot of the more fundamentalist and kind of intolerant and rhetorically at least violent Christian culture that you can observe in yeah. various parts of this country, and that is because of the fact that the substance of these perspectives calls us to account morally as opposed to again affixing all blame on external external uh forces and it is difficult for any person to take a sustained look at him or herself on an internal level and say okay what fires of bigotry or an intolerance or hatred am i feeding within myself based upon the justification that somebody else is worse than I am, and therefore I feel more or less uh, justified in being just a little bit better than them, if in fact I am. If the substance of the nonviolent philosophy were to be clearly articulated and promoted in this current day, then those who profess to be the heirs of King's legacy uh, would have to reckon with the substance of that philosophy. They would have to debate King, the substance of Martin Luther King Jr.'s views, and if they 
And anybody, I think, who tries to advance an argument against his philosophy, well, you would have to do it on the grounds that it was somehow, it's somehow impractical. But of course, I would argue, and most people would argue, that King accomplished a hell of a lot in his short life. Absolutely. In large part through the power of that philosophy. If you were to argue that there was something unethical about his philosophy, well, then I can't even imagine how morally compromised your stand must be. And so there are not a lot of options for engaging King's uh, uh, key, uh, key, the substance of the nonviolent philosophy in a critical way that also allows you to maintain King's mantle, just like there's not a lot of ways that a rigid fundamentalist, I don't know, sort of, I've got nothing against Calvinism per se, but I can think of some Calvinists who are like this, you know, the, it, it, you, you line up their ethical, their, their ethical philosophy or their implicit philosophy and compare it to the Beatitudes, you put a side by side up there and it starts to look pretty unchristian in terms of how we relate and interact with each other morally. So rather than do that side by side, it's easier for folks to just say, oh, Let's build statues of King. Let's put his name over every street. Let's name our schools after him. But let's then do the easier thing and think like some of the more undisciplined militants that we can think of from our past and actually be even, you know, less, less focused and less disciplined and less, uh, cre and, and, and less bound to integrity than they were because we live in a time where things are actually better in some sense, but, but we don't want to admit it anyway. Excuse me for interrupting. I, I can't help but observe that that's what some people do with Jesus, isn't it? Well, that's, they, that's my they point. They put him on up on a pedestal, that's they put his name up over the church, but then they don't follow the teachings. Trying to have uh, your cake and eat it too, man. That's a big part of the problem. <laughs> all right. Uh, I think we need to call it quits here about an hour, uh, but we can have another conversation. John Wood, John Wood Jr., Director of Media Development for Better Angels. He's an African-American. He's a Republican. He's working uh, with an organization that's trying to promote uh, a civic culture that gets us to see the humanity of our fellow citizens across the partisan divide, uh, mm -hmm. a healthier culture than we are able to enjoy at the moment. I wish you Godspeed in that labor, uh, John Wood, and look forward to talking with you again sometime soon here at the Glenn Show. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, Glenn. Okay. Take care now. Uh,